And tonight we have a special distinguished speaker, Dr. Herb Silverman. And he will talk about his book, Candidate Without a Prayer. It's an autobiography of a Jewish atheist in the Bible Belt, which describes his journey from Orthodox Judaism, Judaism, growing up in Philadelphia to apathetic atheists, to accidental activist atheists when he moved to South Carolina. He will also talk about his encounter with Billy Graham, Jimmy Carter, and others he ran for, uh, when he ran for governor of South Carolina. Furthermore, he will discuss his latest book, An Atheist Stranger in a Strange Religious Land is a compendium of some of his writings for the Washington Post, Huffington Post, The Humanist, and other magazines and blogs. And on the table up here, uh, we have two of uh, uh, Dr. Uh, excuse me, Dr. Zilman's books here for purchase, and at a special rate, $10 for all the humanist groups. Dr. Silverman received his PhD in mathematics from Syracuse University and is distinguished professor emeritus of mathematics at the College of Charleston. He is founder and president emeritus of Secular Coalition for America, founder of the Secular Humanist of Low Country in Charleston, South Carolina, and founder and formal faculty advisor to the College of Charleston Students Atheist Slash Humanist Alliance. He has published over 100 research papers in mathematical journals, a couple of books on complex variables, and is the recipient of the Distinguished Research Award and American Humanist Association Lifetime Achievement Award. He has appeared in numerous debates on the topic that include, can we be moral without God? Does God exist? Is America a Christian nation? He has also debated at Oxford Union and Oxford University in England on the topic, does American religion undermine American values? In 1990, a colleague pointed out that uh, atheists were ineligible to hold public office in South Carolina. So after an eight-year legal battle, Dr. Silliman won a unanimous decision in the South Carolina Supreme Court which struck down this religious test requirement to hold public office. Please welcome Dr. Herb Silliman. Uh, thank you, Jim, for that wonderful introduction, and I'm happy to be here. And let me put your mind at ease. I am not going to talk about my complex variables books. <laughs> well, maybe another time if you invite me back for that, but I doubt that you would. Uh, later, I'll talk about my uh, recent book, An Atheist Stranger in a Strange Religious Land. First, I'll talk about my uh, book, Candidate Without a Prayer, which, as uh, Jim mentioned, is an autobiography where I gradually, after growing up in Philadelphia, uh, moved from an apathetic atheist to accidental atheist, and when I moved to South Carolina, and now to what some might consider a, an evangelical atheist. I'll begin with the X-rated part of my book. <laughs> I know, I was cuter then. Many years later, on a tour of Israel, I was barred from several holy sites because of my attire. But one ch church said that I only needed to have my knees covered. <laughs> so I pulled my shorts below my knees and to my surprise, that was okay. <laughs> and that's just one example of how many religions mindlessly follow rules that make no sense. And now, 
for the G-rated part of my talk. I grew up in a Jewish neighborhood, went to a high school with mostly Jews, and hardly ever saw or talked to Gentiles. But when I heard that a charismatic Christian speaker was coming to Philadelphia, named Billy Graham, I went to hear him. And like many others, I had a life-changing experience. After Billy Graham spoke, he encouraged people to come forward and be saved. I didn't even know what that meant, but out of curiosity, I came forward. <laughs> Billy Graham mumbled a few words, and each of us who was saved was given a pastor to talk to. Mine asked, do you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? I said, no. <laughs> uh, he tried fire and brimstone to scare me, but that also failed. But when he found out that I was Jewish, he brought over a converted Jewish pastor to talk to me. After a brief conversation, I found out that his parents were deceased, and I asked, how does he feel knowing that his loving parents are now rotting in hell? He told me they weren't. So then I brought the first pastor back to talk to this pastor. And I just stepped aside and watched Pastor 1 and Pastor 2 arguing about Pastor 2's dead pa parents. And I realized for the first time how much fun it could be talking to religious people. <laughs> and that was my life-changing experience. My first teaching job was at Clark University in Worcester, Massachusetts in uh, 1968. It was during the Vietnam War. In one protest, a number of us were arrested for blocking the draft board and I spent a brief time in jail where I shared a cell with one of my math students. He asked me for math help. And we were let out of jail just about the time he finished his homework. Uh, so for me, going to jail was a lot like holding office hours. Unfortunately. <laughs> Unfortunately, our actions did not stop the war, but I did make one important civil rights contribution in Worcester, <laughs> Massachusetts around that time. After a PhD student of mine passed her qualifying exams, I took her to a local Worcester bar to celebrate. But the bartender told me that the bar was for males only and that she would have to leave. The following day, I brought an African-American woman to that same bar, and the bartender was obviously more uncomfortable being viewed as a racist than a sexist, so he consulted with his manager, and they served us. On the third day, I brought back my female graduate student, and they also served us. And from that day on, this Worcester bar served women. <laughs> it feels no, so nice to be applauded for drinking. <laughs> I moved to South Carolina in 1978 to teach at the College of Charleston. It was my first trip below the Mason-Dixon line and a bit of a culture shock for me and, I think, for South Carolina as well. In my book, I describe my experiences with some of the racism and sexism I saw and how things are slowly changing. Now, I like to engage with progressive religious people who do good work. And I had a wonderful opportunity in 1988. I admire former President Jimmy Carter so I spent a week working at Habitat for Humanity in Atlanta with Jimmy Carter. There I am when I had dark hair right behind him. I didn't quite realize how Christian the organization was. Uh, we were led by its 
founder, Millard Fuller, in daily prayers to Jesus after breakfast, lunch, and dinner. I talked to Fuller and mentioned how uh, uh, we could probably have a lot more people attend if he were inclusive, because we're all there building houses for people. Fuller said he wasn't. He was building houses for Jesus and would stop if he thought that Jesus didn't care. I much preferred Jimmy Carter's viewpoint. We would have dinner in Atlanta and nightly at different African-American churches. One time I walked in with Jimmy Carter and there was a standing ovation. So I whispered in Jimmy's ear, I hope you don't mind, this happens to me wherever I go. <laughs> After teaching at the College of Charleston for 14 years, I had gotten pretty used to living in South Carolina, but I underwent a major life change in 1990 when a colleague pointed out that our South Carolina Constitution prohibited atheists from becoming governor. I knew the U.S. Constitution prohibited religious tests for public office, so I went to the ACLU, and a lawyer there told me that someone would need to mount a legal challenge, an atheist, by running for governor. And he told me that the very best candidate would be me. Well, I looked around and didn't see much competition. So after giving it some thought, I agreed to become the candidate without a prayer. After filing for candidacy, I learned that atheist is a very provocative word, and not just in South Carolina. The Associated Press picked up the story, and the following day, I got a call from a very distressed woman in Philadelphia. <laughs> I, I had to admit that the Philadelphia Inquirer was not the best way for my mother to find out that her only child was a candidate for governor and an atheist. <laughs> I never expected all that publicity, so I thought I could spare my mother such heartache. She didn't so much mind my being an atheist. The problem for her was going public about it. She always wanted me to be, to at least appear respectable, but that never quite happened. <laughs> Meanwhile, Governor Carol Campbell said that our South Carolina Constitution was fine as it was because our country was founded on godly principles. I was invited onto a number of radio talk shows where callers there would frequently say something like, well, as an atheist, I suppose you feel free to go out and rape and murder and do whatever you think you could get away with. My response to such callers was, with an attitude like that, I hope you continue to believe in a god. <laughs> I, I soon realized that I didn't just want to change the Constitution, I also wanted to change some of the hearts and minds of my fellow South Carolinians. The media would usually introduce me as a so-called atheist or an admitted atheist. I'd often ask the host if they ever introduced someone as a so-called Southern Baptist or an admitted Catholic. <laughs> Republican Governor Campbell knew he would have an easy re-election victory, so he refused to debate the other candidate. But I participated in a number of three-way debates with candidates from the Democratic Party and the American Party. That's the old George Wallace party. In a statewide debate on public television, uh, my friends thought that I had won the debate, but the friends of the other candidates, I expect, thought that they had won the debate. 
but a year later, there was an objective way to determine the winner. Of the three participants in that debate, I was the only one who was not in jail. <laughs> the American Party candidate was in jail for driving without a license and refusing to get one because it's none of the government's business. <laughs> The, the Democratic Party candidate, for more traditional reasons, tax evasion. <laughs> During the campaign, I heard stereotypical comments that atheists are mean and angry protesters who do nothing but ridicule religion. I wanted to show that we do have a sense of humor, so here are some of the questions I was asked during my campaign and my answers to them. What do you think are your chances of winning the election? Look, I'm an atheist, not a fool. <laughs> what would be the first thing you would do if elected governor? Demand the recount. <laughs> What would make you believe in God? Perhaps if I won the election. <laughs> it, it would take that kind of a miracle. <laughs> what will happen to you when you die? I know exactly what's going to happen when I die. I'm going to medical school. <laughs> Just like my Jewish mother always wanted me to do. I saw the doctor. Oh, okay. I should have shaved. I did have my day in court, but the judge decided that my case was not right. In other words, he would only rule on the merits if I won the election. Well, to the surprise of no one, I lost. But I'm an optimistic kind of guy, and I always look for positives in a situation. The best for me personally was I met Sharon, who's over there. <laughs> yeah. And she became my one and only groupie during the campaign. <laughs> we actually met in church. But it was the Unitarian Church, the only church that invited me to speak during my campaign. When I lost the election, I blamed Sharon because she had become my campaign manager. Uh -huh. now, now, that sounds like something that Donald Trump would say, except he'd expect people to believe it. So, with politics now in my blood, what to do next? I decided to fulfill my lifelong dream of becoming a notary public. <laughs> uh, that's someone who stamps documents. Actually, I learned in 1991 that atheists are ineligible for any public office under the South Carolina Constitution and notary public would be the easiest one to challenge. So I uh, filled out a form, crossed out, so help me God, and paid my $25 and uh, waited to hear what happened. But Governor Campbell rejected my application. When I asked why, he said it was too bothersome to tell all uh, notary republic applications why they were rejected. Well, in a deposition three years later in 1994, we learned that there had been 33,471 notary applications approved in that time period and that mine was the only one rejected. As far as I know, I'm the only one in the history of South Carolina to be rejected as a notary public. Well, then, uh, as I uh, started winning 
uh, my case in several lower courts, but South Carolina kept appealing it until it reached the South Carolina Supreme Court. And finally, in May of 1997, the Supreme Court ruled unanimously in my favor, nullifying the anti-atheist clause in the South Carolina Constitution. I went to the county clerk's office with Sharon to pick up my notary certificate. Sharon took pictures of the clerk handing me my uh, license and of me holding it above my head in triumph. Now, I don't know what your definition of a loser is, <laughs> but the others in the county clerk's office who knew nothing about my case had quite a chuckle thinking the high point of this guy's life <laughs> is becoming a notary public. <laughs> Uh, one of my students at the College of Charleston, unfamiliar with my case, saw the notary certificate prominently displayed in my office and asked me if I had to go to law school to become a notary public. <laughs> I said, no, it wasn't quite that simple. <laughs> <laughs> Law school would have taken only three years. <laughs> it took longer to get my notary license than my PhD in mathematics. <laughs> it, it should not have taken me eight years to get a notary license or happen the way it did, but it was well worth the wait. Incidentally, not only will I sign copies of my book, I'll also notarize it for you. <laughs> you, know, you. You've probably had many authors assign a book, but none who have notarized it. <laughs> Throughout all my endeavors, Sharon has been a wonderful friend and partner. So, after living in sin for 10 years, Sharon and I got married in our home on January 1st, 2000 at 12.01 a.m. Sharon wanted me to get dressed up for the occasion, so she got me a tuxedo t-shirt <laughs> to wear. Now, I had never told my mother about anyone I ever dated, but I figured it was about time. So, I brought Sharon home to meet Mom. Even though Sharon wasn't Jewish, my mother was relieved to learn that someone actually liked me. <laughs> I, I told an Orthodox aunt about it, and she had just one question. Is she Jewish? When she found out the dreaded answer that Sharon Frata Pietro is not Jewish, this aunt refused to even meet her. Well, I mean, that, for us, when we married late in life, that we just felt sorry for this aunt. But that happens in Orthodox families with kids who marry in their 20s, and that can really uh, tear a family apart. I had a more liberal aunt. Uh, who I told that Sharon and I are both atheists, and she said, couldn't you marry a Jewish atheist? <laughs> <laughs> During my run for governor, I got a considerable amount of hate mail, as you might expect, but I also heard from a number of people who thought that they were the only atheist in South Carolina. So, in 1994, I helped form a local group, the Secular Humanists of the Low Country, which has become a vibrant community with over 150 active members. Here's our Secular Humanists of the Low Country t-shirts, and here's the back of our shirts <laughs> with my favorite pun. <laughs> I also learned about several national atheist and humanist organizations, and I joined them all because they were involved in issues I supported. 
but each was doing its own thing and ignoring other like-minded organizations. I wanted to show our strengths in numbers and cooperate on issues that affect all secular Americans. So in 2002, I helped form the Secular Coalition for America, whose mission is to increase the visibility of and respect for non-theistic viewpoints and to protect and strengthen the secular character of our government. We formed as a political advocacy group to allow unlimited lobbying on behalf of secular Americans, finally giving atheists a voice in our nation's capital. We went from all volunteers to a dedicated staff of six. Not quite what the religious right has, but it's a reasonable start. We now have 19 national member organizations and we hope to expand to 50 active state secular coalitions. And we can certainly use help from committed activists like many of you. So please sign up for our action alerts and consider supporting the Secular Coalition for America. And that's our website, secular.org. As president of the Secular Coalition, I was invited to participate in a debate at Oxford University in England. We were told to wear tuxedos, which I rented and wore for the one and only time in my life. The debate topic was, does American religion undermine American values? I began, you just heard Richard Lowry, editor of National Review, complain about how difficult it was to be a conservative in New York City. Now, I'll tell you what it's like to be an atheist in South Carolina. And then I related some of my stories. And I closed with, in this melting pot called America, we are one nation under the Constitution, or maybe under Canada. <laughs> but we are not one nation under God. Given how the religious right opposes the teaching of evolution or any scientific or social view that conflicts with a literal interpretation of the Bible, we are really becoming one nation under educated. <laughs> Our side won. I also enjoy debates with ministers which is often the first opportunity for Christians to hear an atheist point of view from an atheist rather than from their minister. One such debate was on, can we be moral without God? There were over 800 in the audience, mostly from the minister's megachurch. During the debate, we got to question each other. My favorite question for the minister was, how would you behave differently if you stopped believing in God? The minister thought for a minute and then said, I'm often tempted by other women, but I don't act on that temptation because of my love of Jesus, <laughs> knowing how much it would hurt Jesus. <laughs> well, that gave me an easy answer. I'm all, often tempted, but don't act on it because of my love of Sharon, knowing how much it would hurt Sharon. <laughs> I think even the minister's wife preferred my answer. <laughs> <laughs> Whether to base decisions on the needs of an imaginary God or real human beings is the essential difference between conservative religionists and humanists. Now, I always look for common ground with religious people, even if it's difficult, as in the following case. Now, I know you're thinking, what could I possibly have in common with Jerry Falwell. Well, Jerry Falwell once said, God doesn't hear the prayers of a Jew. Oh. Oh. Wow. I agree with Jerry Falwell. <laughs> <laughs> of course, 
for very different reasons. <laughs> Again, here's my website, herbsilverman.com, for more information and debates, including my debate when I was running for governor. And again, I'll be happy to sign and notarize this book, as well as my recent book, An Atheist Stranger in a Strange Religious Land. And I'll now give a few excerpts from this latest book. Uh, this first piece is about one of my more interesting experiences as a college professor. Atheists are often accused of being militant because we passionately uh, uh, promote separation of religion and government. For instance, when the College of Charleston purchased a church building with a cross on top, I told uh, President Alex Sanders, who's president of the college, uh, that he should now remove the plus sign on top of the building. Uh, Sanders did, but not before uh, describing our encounter in the local paper, the Charleston Post and Courier, saying, I will just assign the building to Dr. Silverman as his office. Across at the top and Herb Silverman at the bottom would be an equalizing force. I told Professor Silverman that if he kept quiet about the cross, he would not be nailed to it. <laughs> now, I wasn't offended by Sanders' humor, but the community was outraged that I referred to the cross as a plus sign. Angry writers complained about my offending Christians, though nobody seemed concerned by Sanders' remark about my being nailed to the cross. Now, here's an excerpt about labels. There are some terms that lots of atheists use that I find inaccurate or misleading. Non-believer. I believe in many things. I just don't believe in any gods. Lack of faith. It's not a lack. Uh, it's, uh, I feel that I gained freedom from religious superstition. Abandonment of religion. I didn't abandon religion as one abandons a child. I matured and gave up uh, uh, childish religious beliefs. Atheist, but spiritual. I was on a panel of atheists at a Unitarian church with me the only unspiritual atheists. Uh, the other speakers said they were atheists, but spiritual. When it was my turn, I began. Jonathan, the previous speaker, is a child molester, but I then paused. It didn't sound so bad because I qualified my comment with a but. I didn't like the Jonathan uh, and others distance themselves from typical atheists with uh, their butt. Jonathan remains a spiritual atheist, but now without a butt. That's B-U-T. <laughs> Next, we have God talk for atheists. Some atheists use God as a metaphor and are falsely assumed to hold the God belief. The uh, most famous example is Einstein's God does not play dice with the universe. Similarly, the late Stephen Hawking said, if we discover the theory of everything, uh, reconciling general relativity with uh, quantum theory, we will know, quote, the mind of God. When atheist physicist Peter Higgs proposed the existence of a particle now called the uh, Higgs boson, the media mislabeled it the God particle. Many scientists had been calling it the goddamn particle <laughs> because of its elusive nature. <coughs> also, uh, the, uh, lots of people use uh, God talk uh, as curse words, 
Like, for instance, uh, a lot of euphemisms for deities are things like holy cow, which replaces holy Christ, though not in India where cows are sacred. Holy shit has nothing to do with divine defecation. <laughs> and if you're an unrepentant sinner, gosh, might darn you to heck. <laughs> We often use God talk in anger, like God damn it or Jesus Christ. I'll share with you an immodest personal goal. I'd like my name to become a curse word. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, just like uh, I'd like to hear people say, Herb, damn it. <laughs> and imagine my pleasure when somebody says, Jesus H. Christ, as I assume, the middle initial stands for Herb. <laughs> I know, that was a Herb awful jerk joke. <laughs> now I make a case for a title that I would really like to have. Pope Herb. <laughs> now, hear me out. The Catholic Church can look especially foolish when it makes up different rationalizations for its positions. For instance, it used to accept the wisdom of St. Bonaventure, since only the male was made in the image of God, only the male can receive the godlike office of priest. After such claims became embarrassing, even to the church, the story became only males can hold positions of leadership because all the apostles were male. Well, since all the apostles were Jews, most of whom were married, I'm more qualified to be pope than celibate Gentiles. So either the church must again change its reason, or I'd like future consideration as Pope Herb. My first act would be to declare ex cathedra, invoking papal infallibility, that all future popes must be atheists, turning Catholicism into an evidence-based religion. <laughs> now about my mathematics career. I have a connection to someone who once was the most famous mathematician in this country, Ted Kaczynski, the Unabomber. I never met Ted, but he and I were in the same mathematics research field, and I published articles with his dissertation advisor. And that was when I was on a sabbatical leave at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. Uh, well, that's where Kaczynski got his PhD. When K Kaczynski was caught, a slightly paranoid mathematics colleague became concerned that uh, atheists might be under a lot of pressure uh, because of a stereotype of mathematicians. But it helps that the only stereotype that people have of mathematicians and criticize them for is their eccentric behavior. Mathematicians and mathematics and morality don't necessarily go together. And certainly we know that Religion and morality don't either. There are hardly any mathematicians or atheists in prison, though there are certainly the majority in prison are very religious or claim to be. Sometimes it's easier to make a point with a pithy sentence. So I have a chapter on such sound bites, and I'll close with a sample. In the beginning, was the word, and the word was aardvark. <laughs> if the Bible is mistaken in telling us where we came from, how can we trust it to tell us where we are going? I view the Christian God the same way Christians view the Greek gods. Faith-based knowledge is like regular knowledge, but without the knowledge. 
humans are just fish plus time. Gods don't kill people. People with gods kill people. God is 100% malevolent, but only 70% effective, which explains our world today. Life is a sexually transmitted disease with a 100% uh, mortality rate. It's well known that 87.3% of statistics is made up. <laughs> Finally, some folks waste a lot of time and energy trying to interpret difficult, anachronistic, and contradictory biblical passages. So I'll make it easy for you and sum up both the Old and New Testaments in five words each. Old Testament. Obey the Lord or die. <laughs> New Testament. Believe in Jesus or fry. <laughs> Thank you. I'm now happy to entertain any questions. Yes. How many votes did you receive as candidate for governor? Well, I, I wasn't officially on the ballot because no party would accept me, uh, but I uh, ran as a write-in candidate. And what happened in a lot of precincts, uh, they threw away all of the write-in candidates. So I got thrown away along with Mickey Mouse and Donald Duck. But some were counted, and I did get a little over 300 official votes. And times have changed a lot nationally, and especially in South Carolina. So I imagine today I would have many more votes. But I'm hoping that candidates will actually run at, with a chance of winning and being an open atheist. Perhaps not initially in South Carolina, but elsewhere. Yes. Would you consider running in Michigan? <laughs> <laughs> I, I would uh, get more votes in Michigan even today than in South Carolina, but I'm hoping that younger people who are, have been more engaged, and I, I would not recommend starting with running for governor. I would think just a s local school boards or city council where there's often not much competition is a way uh, and an effective way to engage. So I would encourage all of you either to run or help support someone who's an open atheist or humanist to run and, and help change our culture. A lot of what the Secular Coalition does is follow what the Christian Coalition did. They started at with totally different views, but they started with taking over school boards and we saw how effective they were and we want to mimic the good stuff that they did uh, without the bad. Uh, a question uh, that I have concerning your mathematics background. I wonder if you could tell me whether you think that life itself is a wave function. <laughs> well, the, the, the point for the other people would be that if you have a wave, you have a, uh, a, an incident which happens that's, that's translated into uh, a future time, and, but the material part of the wave doesn't move, but only the energy mm -hmm. of the wave. So I wondered whether we could, set it, could, could consider life itself as an energy, as that kind of an energy. Well, un unlike a lot of Christian fundamentalists, when confronted with a question whose answer I don't know, I say, I don't know. It might be. Someday there might be evidence one way or another, but I'll stay neutral at this point. And I don't feel like, it's certainly an interesting question, but I'm not sure it ha will have much application to our culture today, but it is interesting. Just out of curiosity, what year was it again that you ran for governor? 1990. For future reference, just as an aside, with the connections we have with Rooster, what's the name of that bar? 
Uh, it was on Main Street, I know, but I think, uh, like all other bars that used to be men's for men's only, uh, uh, it's like any other bar, unless it's already closed. But I know it was a, about a half a block from Clark University. So if you uh, go to Clark University, walk up and down Main Street, you'll either see the bar or see it's out of business. Because this was in 1973. Uh, Did they make a big famous deal out of it, like they saw this in New York? Uh, no, uh, I, it just, I asked others to go to that bar, and they just quietly did it. Because I think that had been a tradition, and maybe some men there liked it, but I think they were a bit more progressive than in South Carolina, so they didn't want to you know, fight it or make a big deal out of it, so they pretended that they were reasonable. And, and in the future, they became that. Mathematicians are noted for being logical thinkers. You try it. Okay, so I'm curious to know your observations as to your optimism or pessimism in relation to what you see going on in this country? I realize it's a big question. I'm hoping that mm -hmm. in a general sense you could just give us a, a feeling for that. Well, not only are we logical thinkers, but everyone here is also evidence-based. And despite some blips, uh, I, th I think uh, are very optimistic. And there's one person in the last couple of years that has most helped our movement and give credit where it's due, Donald Trump. Because among other things, all of the organizations got many more members, like the ACLU went way up, and uh, people are becoming much more energized politically. Plus, evangelicals are having a tough time uh, avoiding uh, looking like hypocrites. So in the short term, because of that, that's helped. But even before that, I think younger people are becoming much more skeptical than people our age, in part because of the internet, where people are uh, hearing about other uh, points of view. And the largest growing demographic are what's called the nuns, N-O-N-E-S. Uh, and they're uh, the ones with the good habits. And they're skeptical about religion. They don't necessarily join our organizations, but they are not religious. Well, I was thinking beyond religion, just in general, the, the social environment, the political environment. You, obviously, you're, you, know, you, you pay a lot of attention mm -hmm. to those things yeah. beyond the religious yeah. aspect. OK, well, know? when you say the social environment, a lot of the social is connected with religion, like would you call LGBT a social or religious? And even younger people, including evangelicals, are more tolerant of or and open to LGBT than the older evangel evangelists. So I think because uh, inquiring minds are finding out a lot more and they hear so many points of view, um, optimistic about them being open uh, to social views, political views that they hadn't been before. So based on evidence and logic, I, I am optimistic in the future. Unless, of course, uh, we have a nuclear war in North Korea and, or Iran, then I become more pessimistic. Herb, how do you feel about winning the primary election in this room well, I, first, I want to profoundly thank all of you that you would rather come to hear me than watch Stormy Daniels. <laughs> You're a wonderful minority in that sense. <laughs> Now, if people like us can get on 60 Minutes or major shows, that would be a real accomplishment. We recorded it. Oh, <laughs> well, that's okay. Yeah.
preferably getting on national TV for reasons other than how Stormy Daniels managed to do so. But she, more than others, might help bring down Donald Trump, which uh, would make her more effective than many of us atheists and humanists. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And I have my notary and pen available.